Hello, I am William Bragg, founder and president of Kensington Community Television. I'm standing here outside the Friends Arch Street Meeting House, located at 4th and Arch, right here in the city of Philadelphia. In effort to bring you the very best in quality programming from a Christian perspective, KCTV is launching a new series of vignettes, which I have entitled the Quaker City Minute. In kind to the nostalgic FYI segments that were produced by Hal Linden way back in yesteryear, the Quaker City Minute will be exploring timely euphemisms, quips, and anecdotes of the Quaker following. In short, one-minute venues that will actually be hosted by real present-day Quakers. So sit back and relax, and put on your thinking caps, and join me as together we search out the seeds of the Gruen Nation. In the Book of Revelations, this is the, the letter to the Church of Philadelphia, I've set before thee an open door which no one can shut. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> oh, lady! This is Dennis Payne for Kenston Community Television. I'm sitting here at Patricia Shore. We're going to be talking about the seed of a nation. Good morning, Trish. Good morning, Dennis. The well, seed of a nation is an idea that William Penn had when there was persecution over in England to start a virgin province, uh, a new town, a new way of um, dealing with each other on the basis of equality and freedom of religion and government uh, with um, the consent of the people. So William Penn uh, got a big grant of land from the king, uh, Charles, and, um, they ne and they named it Pennsylvania. You're really, talking about this sitting behind right, us. Right, really he wanted to name it Sylvania, but the king himself put Penn in front of it because, uh, because um, William Penn's father uh, was the reason why William Penn got all this land because he was owed money by the king. So when he, when he got all this land, he started to sell it, and he still, sold little pieces of it to different um, people in uh, Germany and in all different sects. Uh, persecuted religious communities were able to come here and practice their religions. Philadelphia has beautiful churches and I think it's because people came here um, invested in being able to worship as they please and so they built these communities around their churches. William Penn was around in London at the time of the Great Fire and so he saw how people were just perished in the streets. So that's why he planned the way he did, in, in a grid pattern and with four, with five different um, parks. There's the there's Logan Square, there's Rittenhouse Square, there's Washington Square, there's Franklin, and then the center one where City Hall is now, that was Center Square. So all those places where if anything happened, people would be able to go there, some open space. Space, open space. So it was, um, a, a lot of things have been still uh, great for us, you know, the freedom of liberty and, the, and conscience and um, the way the city set up to, you know, know where our ideals have come from and to be able to, you know, ground ourselves in, in, that, um, in, that, in that ideal again. And what is the difference between Quakers and Pur Puritans? The Puritans came uh, uh, a little earlier to America than Friends did and they wanted to create a pure uh, society which is much different than the variety and, and diversity that the, that the Friends um, were created. So actually the, uh, there were some Quakers who went to Boston to protest how, um, how strict they were and, how, uh, and, and just the, that Puritan way and they were told to leave and they said don't come back and they came back. Wasn't that that one lady? Mary Dyer. Yeah, Mary you Dyer, have a picture yes, of her. Yes, we got yep, it. And she came and she sat down and, and she didn't leave and she got hung. So she was a, a martyr for uh, liberty of conscience. Why did they hang her again? Exactly why? They said that she, because she didn't believe what they wanted to believe. Just like in England, if she um, she went against. They didn't want any Quakers at the, in in, in, their, uh, in Boston. So they said, if you come back, we'll kill you. And they said she came back. She had uh, five kids, and you know the youngest one was ten, and she just gave it all up. And she's now, you know, she lives on as a martyr and as a um, symbol of conscience. It's a big difference. Um, the friends down here, the, the diversity, the openness, the things like that, and plus the kind of um, business type thing, you know, real practical down earth thing. So they say that the friends came um, to America to do good and they did very well indeed. <laughs> we're meek and we're inheriting. It turns out a lot of people had a, um, a flair for business and since they, you know, their prices were their prices, they weren't going to bargain. Everybody felt like they could trust, so they started growing business-wise. As far as the friends from what they first started out here in America to what they now evolved into, where do you see them today? Uh, 
how we recognize what a friend is, what are they doing, what's their, uh, let's say, what's their agenda, for lack of a better word, how they uh, promoting or are they promoting, what's going on with modern day friends? Right, well there's um, no evangelism or proselytizing. If you can't, if you haven't found the friends and, and sat there, and you know, it's, you're not going to really hear about them because they don't, but their actions speak much louder than their words. They've, what kind of actions are they doing? They, um, they uh, help um, with um, peaceful, um, peaceful social actions in different countries. You know, when yeah, global citizen uh, type stuff. Right, global citizen type stuff. And plus, um, there's the Friends Committee for National Legislation there in Washington, and they lobby Congress. Mm -hmm. Friends have always um, lobbied Congress. They even lobbied uh, Lincoln. <laughs> There's a very good story about that. They lobbied what, Lincoln, they made him feel bad. What was that about? About slavery. Okay. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, activity that way. Okay. Um, and from the, the difference you would see, there's Quakers don't wear any special clothing anymore. The Amish just, you know, stayed the way they were. They wanted to stay that way. So they're still wearing their clothing that they wore in the 16, you know, hundreds. Right. They're still, don't, you know, do things the same way they do with their horses and right. their land. And, um, and, uh, they're a closed community, mm -hmm. so um, I don't know uh, the difference b between the Amish and the Friends. The Friends are cosmopolitan. The Friends are, you know, they're up on times. Yes, and they're, they're, they're not. not they don't. Person. They're not a. Um, they're not a separated community anymore. Right. There's just just some changes in the way that things are run, and uh, and people are able to, you know, just do their own conscience. So when if but if something comes up and it's uh, a concern, like if something bothered a Quaker or you can be able to get a lot of support and be able to have a powerful voice if you um, had get the support of the meetings and the real meetings. Many, many of these multinational corporations okay. were started by Quakers way back when when they were being so successful. Friends are not really into symbols and badges of recognition of any sort like that, but a couple American symbols that were donated from the Friends to the American people. What exactly is the history? Well, a lot of the symbolism that quintessentially American, the American flag and the Liberty Bell, right. are uh, were Quakers. The Liberty Bell was cast for the 50th year to commemorate William Penn's Charter of Privileges, to proclaim liberty throughout the land and all the inhabitants thereof. And that was liberty of conscience, because uh, William Penn um, was thrown in jail in, in, in England for his for conscience sake. and. Um, he had a tough time uh, when he was growing up, uh, you know, as a as a um, an activist and as a uh, politician. So he wanted to make a place where people would have um, freedom of religion. So the Liberty Bell was actually cast way before the um, the American War for Independence, and the American flag was uh, sewn by a Quaker woman. Uh, Betsy Ross was a Quaker, but she was a fighting Quaker. So many Quakers didn't want to. Um, be involved in the American Revolution because war is not the answer. But some other Quakers really felt that there was a time and a place and now this was it and so they started the Fighting Quakers. The um, Free Quaker Meeting House is just right one block up the street and she um, met there. She was one of the first members and she was the last member. That's Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross. She had her own business. She had bunch of daughters. She was married Who came three up with times. that design? Her herself? Or yes, she, well, was it um, she had like, because of the state house was right down the street, right. she was very close. So they walked over, um, I think a delegation, I think even including George Washington, walked yes. over and talked about designs. And she said, look, I can make a, a star, like a five-pointed star with one clip. And she right. folded up the, the cloth, she clipped it, and it was came five, out, a right. star. So, you know, that's how they, um, that's how they started that. Right here, there is a, this is a, land is a graveyard in the, They've got a lot of people, unmarked graves. This is 4th and Arch. Yes, we're in 4th and Arch Street, and uh, ironically, the first Marine Commandant is buried, buried here. I know the, the uh, Marines keep wanting to come and shoot off uh, 21 gun salutes, but the Quakers say no. <laughs> <coughs> oh. They say the flowers are fine, but not the 21 gun salute. All these things um, just uh, testify to the simplicity and the trust in you know the, the in, inner good, you know, innate. Uh, part of us that um, is compassion, that knows the right thing to do. Is there by chance a, an interesting little story that you would like to say about on the subject that we've been talking on? Yes, well, um, there's a, there was an activist from way back, his name was Benjamin Lay, and he uh, fought against slavery his whole life. 
and he would do things. He was a hunchback, he was four feet tall. Everybody knew what he looked like. He was very famous in Philadelphia, and he would make the friends feel bad, the friends that still kept <clears throat> slaves. In one meeting, he, um, he had a Bible, and he had filled it with like a, a bubble full of blood, and he stabbed the Bible, and the blood went all over for everyone else. He sat right out here in front of the yearly meeting and stuck his foot in the snow, and everyone's like, Benjamin, come on in, Benjamin. He's like, no, as long as slaves are suffering, I'm going to suffer too. And, he would, and, and they, you know, they worked with him and they eventually, eventually started supporting um, abolition of slavery. But I mean, that's how it happened. It's not like friends are great or anything, but there's right. usually one person in there, in any group, that's gonna fight for what's right. Mm -hmm. And the thing about friends is that that person is listened to. And that's the only difference is that that person is listened to and that person is maybe given some consideration and everybody has to kind of think about it and if it's true or not then that's when this decisions get so the individual actually has a say within the congregation that's, yes it all comes from the individual which is very important but it's then within the community that's when things start to happen so it's not individualism versus communitarian no, they're supposed to be it's one, one and the, the other yeah. yeah so one inside the other because you can't be an individual all in alone village. in no. anything and and if you even if you do and build what up the whole world it wouldn't be enough mm -hmm. but if you were you know were in, um, in it in a community of caring people who are willing to take what you have to give right. and willing to hear the real truth, then you're able to uh, make a change. Then you're being empowered, even if you know you're not exactly well. You know, look, hey, you know, <laughs> you're you're still listening to and empowered. What, what what suggestions do you have for future vignettes down the road for us? Oh, there's so many great uh, stories that can help um, people to understand the city that they're living in. I mean, it's not just their friend's religion, it's just the city it was a Quaker city, right. which was known as that. So I think more, the more people know about the buildings they walk by, about what the kind of people that lived here before, the story behind the story, behind the history, I think the better people are going to feel about where they are. But they're going to feel better about Philadelphia, right. and they're going to feel more empowered about things they can do in our time. Isn't there other ways that people can find out more information about the Friends Quakers? I mean, you just mentioned books that you personally research. Mm -hmm. Is that the best way to find out about the Friends? Or is there what other ways? There's a, something called the Quaker Information Center on 15th and, and Cherry, and they have a lot of pamphlets and books. And uh, they're online too. They are online yeah, as well. Yeah, and um, a lot of uh, great books and literature that I had to read in book form are now online. But uh, like I said, just to walk the city, to, to research the, um, you know, just being in this area, this square mile, there's so much uh, history that can, that can be inspiring for today, but that also can give us a sense of who we are, where we came from, what we're capable of, and what's happened since then. So, you know, it's, it's a nice way coming down to, to, to Old City, walking around if you haven't been to, you know. I get lost in Old City. The only place I can get lost is in Old City, and I only get lost in history. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Not, in land get lost in history. Not in landmass. Not in landmass. I can't get lost that way, but as far as the history, it's like my mind just gets so bewildered when I walk around it and I literally see everything you're saying and I, I keep thinking, that symbol, where did that symbol come from? And yeah. then I find out later on, like I, for growing up as a kid, I didn't know that Liberty Bell and the flag was Quaker, yeah. not until I got in my early 20s. So yes, go take a tour around old Philadelphia. Stay curious. Yes. There's, there's clues everywhere. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of information out there, but you have to kind of dig for it. So yes, you, know, yes. you, you have to be a bit of a, um, a detective because there's a, there's a certain story that's popular. It's the one everybody likes. You know, well, that's what I was referring to. All <laughs> information is not on Google. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so coming down and, uh, and, and walking the bricks, that's what I think. Walking pray the bricks. and walk. <laughs> yeah, pray and walk around and you'll see you know, what, what it means. But. As far as William Penn goes, do you believe he was a friend activist or an activist friend? I think those are just two of this, one of the same thing. It's like you um, pray and you, and you wonder and you worship and uh, then you go out and you do things. I think, you know, uh, matching Worship and action is the best way. It's like putting one foot uh, in front of the other and all like breathing in and out. Or, you know, without, if you keep just being inspired, 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 you could like in a big puffy, like, a, you know, all puffed up with yourself. But that's why you have to give it out. That's why you have to keep transmitting it. So you just, you know, keep the, um, keep the living waters going or else they're going to get stagnant. So I think William Penn's, um, his, uh, his courage and his uh, sacrifice for what he did for Pennsylvania, what he did for 
civil liberties and religious liberty is um, just wonderful. And I think, you know, if he had done, if he just stayed in his castle with his dad, we would have not even been here. So I think being an activist doesn't seem like maybe a great idea during your lifetime when you have to deal with all of the, um, all of the consequences. Um, the, you know, he lost all, all of his money mm -hmm. <laughs> and he, he lost a lot of his standing and he spent time in jail. But those things um, were valuable to us. So that's why I think um, <clears throat> seeing the big picture, you know, even beyond maybe even your own lifetime, like how some people plant a tree, even if they're never going to see it, those kind of um, impulses are important for us and posterity. That famous Benjamin Franklin statement where you trade off or whatever, you know the correct statement, okay, how do you see that with the Franks? Uh, trading uh, liberty for security? Correct. Yeah, and, you, and then you wouldn't get either. Right. I think um, it's playing it safe and uh, not, you know, going for just just to just to uh, preserve what you have, then you might lose it. But to go and you know fulfill your life and really um, and really stand for liberty and freedom, it's costly sometimes in the, in, in this life. But I think uh, it's great. Um, it's the only way to live because otherwise we're kind of like ghosts if we're not really ourselves and we don't have liberty of conscience and we're being. Um, told what to think and what to do, that's just not what we are as people. And I think that the, um, the friends, um, the Quaker uh, seed here that, that was planted so deeply is still bearing fruit in the individuals that are uh, you know, coming up in America today and sh just showing the world new things. And just, it's, I, I love this country and I know that things are going to change for the better, but it's only if, act if people start becoming active and if they start participating in the process and if they start you know agitating for change when you need to so I, I have get a lot of um, inspiration and strength from his activism from way back when if you look at up the trial of William Penn it's quite dramatic what he did yeah so I think it's um, gonna be great for people to learn more about where this city came from more about what the friends did and are trying to do and more about what we could have possibly have been if we had kept um, to our ideals of, uh, of freedom and liberty and of conscience. So it's, it's kind of sad to see how things are happening in these days, <laughs> you know, with people getting, um, getting busted for protesting and things. I think that it's just totally in the same spirit as the first friends who got thrown Fight in Fighting against the king. Yeah, so it's a, it, we have, um, you know, we have big enemies, we have big problems, but we also have that. Uh, uh, big hearts and big, you know, strength to be able to do this. If mm -hmm. we only knew how, if we only knew our own power. It's like, that's, you know, like, a, like I mean, the city's almost like a, a beautiful woman that doesn't know that she's beautiful. She, all she can that's see is her flaws. No, it's the, all she can see is her flaws and the pockmarks, but there's just such beauty here mm -hmm. that I think um, we need to translate that better. Even knowing what that is, because that wasn't supposed to be just a small thing. It was supposed to be universal. They thought the whole country was going to go Quaker. But and from a friend, with a friend, to a bunch of friends, this is Dennis Payne with Kensington Community Television sitting with Trisha Short in the Quaker Meeting House at Fourth and Arch Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Good evening. That's a cut. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.